Hi everyone. Fasten your seat belts. We are now taking off on time for another great one hour journey on digitization of MSME finance. And today our destination is talent development in the digital age. This is the third trip BFC is organizing since the end of July. Our first trip four weeks ago was for digital transformation from a strategic perspective. And then two weeks later, we have been discussing about the customer journey, about products and delivery channels. And today we will be discussing about the most important factor, the people's factor. So how do we get the buy-in from staff for change, how we enable them to change and how we make change happen with people without pushing up the employee sick leave ratio. And as you can imagine from the cartoon, which is showing on the next slide, and you see on the cartoon here that uh, getting employees on board is a substantial organizational change. Yeah, that's what digital information, digital transformation is all about. It's not a question of medical art, but rather of managerial competence. So change is possible if it makes sense to all stakeholders. And to make sure we arrive in one hour at our target destination, let me now introduce my experienced crew, starting from Debbie Carlton, who advises organizations on how to deal with competence challenges arising from digital transformation. In her function as a director at Dynamic Knowledge, a London-based consulting boutique for over 70 years, she will share with us a showcase on, guess what? No kidding. We can learn from the oil and gas industry for the financial service industry. Debbie, thank you for being connected with us today from the UK. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Delighted to be here, Michael. Great. And I move on to the next crew member, Sergio. Alguacil Malo, he's a learning and development expert, and he has been the former lead of learning and development for Finca Impact Finance, where he has been building over the past 10 years digital learning systems in Finca's 20 subsidiaries in 20 countries over five continents. Sergio, a very good morning to Florida. You're the earliest bird today in our crew, 4 a.m. Wow, your time. Great, you could make it to our session. Thank you, Michael, and hello, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And I move to Fahim Ali, who is connected from Nairobi. He's a financial inclusion and digital transformations expert. And he will be looking today at the people factor from his perspective as an expert in financial product development in formulation of marketing strategies, credit operations, and a side of his day-to-day -day job as a chief risk officer at Musoni, which is a Kenyan-based branchless MFI. For him, it's a regular contributor to webinars where he shares his experience. Thanks for him for being with us today. Thank you, Michael. I look forward to share my experience. Thank you. Great. And last but not least, I would like to introduce Victoria Stokes, who is an HR consultant. She has seven years of experience as a CIPD chartered HR professional. And before she joined BFC, she has held various HR roles, such as a business partner at Swedish Bank Handelsbanken and a recruitment coordinator at Deloitte. She holds a master's degree in human resource management from the Westminster University. And if that's not all enough, Victoria took another study program in coaching psychology from the University of East London. Thank you for making time to join us today, Victoria. Thank you, Michael. I look forward to it. And last but not least, my name is Michael Kortenbusch. I'm your captain on this flight today, connected from Zurich to moderate this session for you. In my normal life, I'm a consultant in MSME and agricultural finance in emerging markets. And I know also how it feels to change and to lead change from my function as a managing director of BFC. And with this, we kick off 
with the first poll to our audience connected from around 30 countries. So if I may call up the poll, please. Which are the main areas of adjustment in talent management that your organization is planning over the next three years? Please select maximum three answers. And while the poll is running, I'll just explain how you can reach us and also how we have structured the session. So this session has three blocks as always. So we will have a block on the new world of worker and work and workers. That is a start with Debbie showing a showcase. And then we have three other showcases for the next two blocks, agile leadership, how to lead and motivate staff and workplace training in the digital age is a third block. And now how you can give us questions because we want to give you possibility to ask us your questions. We have also prepared questions we got from you earlier. And there are three ways of reaching us. So today, the best way of reaching us during the session is at your Zoom screen. In the bottom, you have the Q&A chat box where you can post your questions and please make regular use of it. But then also you can reach us through our corporate website. And of course, you can email us and you find this all in the chat window as well. So looking forward to a lively discussion. And now we end the polling. So what do we see here? which are the main areas of adjustment in talent management. So we see the leader basically here is adjust the learning process, method, content and channels. That means we have a lot of learning professionals here in the session today. Great. And also enable cultural change connected with that as the second one. And then we have shift towards permanent home office work. OK, that was a result of COVID, I guess. And the others also there. But no little people say replacement of existing stuff with new stuff. That's also very good news. So uh, we don't have to fear we are losing stuff. We just have to requalify them. Great. Good. With this, let's move to block one. And with no further delay, uh, Debbie, I give the floor to you with the exciting example from the oil and gas industry. We want to know what we can learn from that. I'm really intrigued to see can we learn at all something in the financial industry from what you did in oil and gas? Debbie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I'm just going to start with a little bit of context setting. Digital transformations having an enormous impact on work, particularly at the task activity level, uh, how work is done, how that work is coordinated, co coordinated and who does the work, and then how organizations actually attract, select, and deploy and allocate workers to actually do the work. In this context, I really like the, the definition of digital transformation, which is about connecting data, people and things because it puts people right in the center, which is very important. However, most organizations know very little about their people, their aspirations and their competences and often know most when they join the organization. And we're, at, we're really at the point where digital transformation is a call to leaders to actually lead the work digitally. HR's role in this is to adapt the work and the, the processes so that the organizations can be much more agile in developing new capacities, competences and capabilities to adjust to these new digital ways of working. The oil in all of this, in the terms of the sort of talent piece, the people piece, is making sure that we have information on the work activities, the people and the competences. But at the moment, all of that is generally undigitized in organizations and all the data is distributed. We also have a challenge in the HR domain that the language of HR is steeped in very traditional um, areas. It's about employment rather than workers, employees rather than workers. It's the traditional organization de design models. This is neither evidence-based, data-driven, or agile enough to deal with digital transformation. We need to move to a new language if we're going to, to address digital transformation around people. Worker experience in terms of employee experience, talent lifecycle management versus personnel management, work and workforce design versus organizational design. These are just some of the, the aspects. HR is in the people business, and it's a core partner to any digital transformation. But it, digital transformation gives HR two main challenges. They have to completely digitize all of their own operations 
and they've got to transform and diversify the workforce and how the work is led and done. They, these, are, these are big challenges and they have various tools and levers to do that. Michael, if you could go to the first slide, please. Thank you. In the work I do with organizations, um, I developed this model. It's a way of helping organizations think how they can better connect demand and supply of competences to the work to be done in the new digital world of work. Um, the goal is to ensure, and I think most people, you might have to just scroll down on this slide when it's shared with you, is that the organization has got to continually manage capacity, competence, and capability in adjusting to these new digital ways of working to ensure that they have competent staff with the right information and tools doing the right work at the right time. As you can see, there's kind of three key pillars here. Access, how do you attract, connect, accumulate, and access competence on demand? How do you allocate or reallocate the, the work and the people to do the work? And how do you look at different mechanisms of value exchange? Obviously today, we can only just touch on this at a high level. But in essence, what the organization is then trying to decide is what I call the W's of work. What, what, what's the work? Why is the work there? Where could it be done? When could it be done? With whom could it be done? With what tools, etc. And to leave, uh, many of you may know this, the 6B model of talent. How do we buy talent? Do we borrow talent? Do we build talent? Do we buy, how do we bind it to the organization? How do we balance that talent? And now and then we need to bounce talents. So it's a very sort of simple model, but it gets across quite a lot. If anyone's interested, the confidence index is a proxy for uncertainty. So that when we can match people to work opportunities, um, we, can, we can use that to, to make a simple assessment of how the organization is moving forward. If we could move to the next slide, Michael, thank you. We took this model in the oil and gas sector and we designed, built and deployed an experience on demand network so that this organization is a global consultancy could manage full-time employees, contractors, alumni, specialist experts within a network and globally deploy them on projects much more efficiently. At this point in time, the key constraint to the business wasn't capital, it was access to competence and experience, as well as dealing with demographic changes, new ways of working and how people wanted, contractors wanted to work with the organization and advances in technology. We built a cloud-based platform, which uniquely combined the best of talent, competence management and performance management with data analytics and smart discovery and visualization tools with the best of breed, uh, solid social knowledge networks, uh, collaboration, communication, and learning capabilities. So it was a big piece of work. Um, it was a unique platform that was built here specifically for this, this organization. Why did they want it? They wanted to really know much more about all of these individuals who did work for them. They wanted really rich competency, experience, DNAs, so they could match them smartly to different work opportunities. They wanted to have off the balance sheet human ca access to human capital. Um, they wanted to reduce their recruitment costs, particularly their agency costs. And they wanted something that was much faster, um, more scalable, much more evidence and data driven so they could analyze work activities and competencies related to projects and reduce the time to actually match and acquire the, those experiences and deploy people. Um, it did have a profound effect on startup times for projects. We also provided a fast expertise locator if somebody needed to find an expert quickly. Um, and it actually enabled a, a good balance of global and local resources, um, which is important for a lot of uh, evolving and developing economies. And it reduced costs and it uh, got much higher utilization rate of resources in the organization. And of course, importantly, it got contractor and employee loyalty because um, everyone felt they were in a network that they designed and owned. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much, Debbie. That's um, really exciting um, what, you, what you just explained. Uh, a few questions and uh, before I move with the questions, just to all the panelists, I want to ask you one question later or um, the other panelists where I will want to know if you think that the experience of this on-demand model presented by Debbie can also work in the financial service industry where we speak about much smaller uh, organizations and they are servicing, so in a different sector. And um, my first question is, um, you, you say 
uh, Debbie, most organizations, uh, they know too little about their people. I only can agree with that. And, uh, but it sounds like a problem that persisted already for some time. So could you say what was exactly the trigger uh, prompting your clients to tackle that problem in the way you, you described? I, I think the trigger was that we convinced them that we could deal with and find all the unstructured data around the individuals, yes. And we also combined it with a range of techniques, not expecting people to do a lot of form filling. We also use voice technology and in interviews and mind that voice to improve their competency profile. So I think, first of all, you've got to win the hearts and minds of the senior leadership. You've got to show them what you can do with the data and you've got to use techniques that work for the organization. And, and then in the end of the day, the proof is in the pudding. We found people in the organization to deploy on projects that they would never have found. Um, so, you know, that's really how it worked. Okay, so basically the uh, new possibilities for digital transformation, uh, the possibility to, to analyze, collect and structure data allowed to come up with new solutions. That's interesting. The second question I have to you is that when we spoke before the session, you also said that access to capital was actually not the problem, but rather access to talent. You work with the oil and gas industry, corporate big businesses basically, uh, who could pay for such a project. But how could this solution you presented just work for smaller firms? Like if we imagine a financial service, MFIs, banks have a few hundred employees, maybe sometimes a few thousands at most. They work in one market, they work in the service industry. So maybe sharing talent is a bit more tricky than in the oil industry, which is about production. So I just wonder, how do you see that um, the size um, and the different industries, how, how that can really be transferred? A very, a very good question. I think certainly in the UK, we're seeing this kind of uh, platform shared talent pool approach happen in the creative industries, even in, in the restaurant industry, um, IT sectors. It's, it's happening in a number of sectors. I think when organizations are smaller, they, they often have to be more agile and it's better to do it in some kind of network where a group of organizations agree to sign up and share talent pools, yes, and, and loan people on projects or to specific tasks, et cetera. Um, you know, and that can be done inside an organization, but it can be done just as well shared across organizations. Obviously, there's other issues in terms of, you know, trust and management and governance of that that has to be established. Um, but we are seeing a lot of it in, in, uh, in, industry, in service industries happening in the UK. Great. Thank you very much. And with this, I move to the question to uh, uh, the, the other crew members. Uh, so, uh, do you think that the experience on-demand model presented by Debbie can work in the financial service industry? If you could give a very short statement, basically, uh, from your perspective, and uh, who wants to start? Sergio, you want to give it a start? Yes, certainly. It's a very interesting model that I think also relates a lot to uh, people analytics, right? Uh, a basic uh, function that uh, human resources uh, departments should uh, be covering and doing well. Um, given right, the data that is available more and more um, in any human resources department, thanks to modern systems. Thanks. So it could work, basically. Okay. Uh, Victoria, what's your view? Uh, it's a big yes for me as the HR <laughs> business partner. Um, uh, yeah, it would save a, this kind of thing would save a lot of time. Um, I think definitely on the IT, as you mentioned, Debbie, IT side, that would be it would be a fantastic tool. Great, thanks. So uh, to get a bit of controversy, I hope Fahim, uh, you're not agreeing just with Debbie. You have something else to say. I hope at least. <laughs> Please. No, I do agree. Uh, it is a best model. Actually, it works for the leadership analysis. You know, also you uh, to do the the data analytics. You know. Uh, to see what the, the, the people want, what the employees want, you know, and this definitely works well. Uh, so I, I, I really, uh, a big yes. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so, um, Debbie, uh, you, um, you, couldn't, you, you couldn't uh, create a controversy, which I was hoping about, uh, but uh, I think you were probably too convincing with what you presented now. Um, I, I think uh, a very interesting uh, 
experience uh, basically I also liked your reference to the change of language we need to think differently about uh, recruitment I think you mentioned also there's a book um, what was the book about um, uh, yeah, the, yeah? There's, there's, there's uh, two key books I would recommend. One is called Lead the Work, and the prime author is David Creelman. Um, and the second one I would read is from uh, David and Michael Suskin, Richard Suskin, who've written The Future of Professions. It's all about the, we're in the post professional society and the systemization of work. Uh, those okay. are definitely books to read. Yeah, Lead the Work. I see that is already coming up in the, uh, in the chat. So, dear audience, if you want to look at this book, then um, uh, you see the, the details written there. Thank you very much again, Debbie. We are moving on. We, um, the flight is going on. We move to block two now, and we start again with a survey. So the block two is about agile leadership, how to lead and motivate staff to, uh, staff to actively support digital transformation. Can we have the poll, please? So what makes a good agile leader? That's that's the poll we want to um, uh, want to ask you. What's uh, what makes a good agile leader? The poll should come up in a in a second from now. <clears throat> and um, we will hear a case study from uh, Fahim and another case study from Victoria. After that, so um, the poll should come up. And while it's being uh, called up, uh, dear attendees, if you have any questions, please write them in the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen. And we will pick up uh, your questions and try to answer them during the session. I see the poll is running uh, for some reason. I couldn't see it, so that's great. Uh, okay, with no further delay, Fahim, um, you will tell us about digital transformation project implementation experience and how actually to motivate staff um, to, uh, to support the project. So, Fahim, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Michael, uh, with the permission of the captain. Yes, this model is to, to give you the understanding that project implementation in digital transformation is also important. Uh, it's, it's important to, uh, to see what is exactly we need uh, in our transformation. Uh, but first and foremost, you see the agile development is required uh, to, to review your tentatively projects, to see how the projects are running. Because the digital transformation always starts from your project. And uh, the key agile approach is the new pattern, is not the basic previous pattern of waterfall model, or you know, the, the, the previous pe people were doing the business was sending the requirements, and then you uh, as an IT was doing the, some developments, and then again, they just, you know, deploy. And then again, people test and they uh, go, you know, live uh, over there. So in my experience in Musoni and Musoni in East Africa and also in Nepal or West Africa, I have deployed number of, you know, projects. Uh, and then we always use the V-shaped and the Agile model, uh, which is more of the Scrum Master framework. It is actually we develop the team first. Uh, first of all, you have to make a team. Uh, you need to bring a team of different people. You need to bring the operations people you need to bring, you know, the marketing people, you need to bring the people from the product, you need to bring from the people from the business mindset, you need to bring from the IT or even, you know, the tech or innovation people. Uh, they need to first take the commitment that what exactly they need to do with that project. And that commitment is, you know, quite important. Uh, next slide, uh, Michael. Thank you. So the first is actually the, uh, you know, that they need to bring the commitment and then empower the team. Uh, what exactly the team need to bring? They need to create the dialogues. Uh, the dialogues is too important in the team uh, because if you do not have the dialogues in the team, uh, you need to bring the different mindset of the people so that these different mindset of the people discuss the way of the project, how it will go. For example, the small project example, you need to bring the RPA, the, the robotic process automation in your loan disbursement, for example, in, uh, in microfinance uh, or bringing the BI solution, the business intelligence solution. So how you will bring that, first of all, the create dialogue is, you know, uh, more important. How, why, as Debbie said, it is more important to discuss that how, why and why we need this one. Then you need the management commitment. Then exactly the collaborative different culture of the people will be there in the team and they will work, uh, you know, that for, for what reason we, uh, we need this project. 
And then again, you need to invest in the training. And then my next colleague will also, uh, you know, explain you that how the training is more important and why behind this digital, you know, change or transformation. And the training is cannot be the different, the, the previous training as it was, you know, we need to be a different, you know, kind of uh, uh, bringing the module of the training or capacity module. And then again, we need to bring that uh, the roadmap. Uh, we need to develop the roadmap that exactly what kind of agile AML, like, you know, uh, the ALM or, or the agile, uh, uh, you know, uh, dashboards, what we need, what exactly that the, the projects should look like. This is what we need to bring. And then allow people to, you know, trans, uh, to, to do the experiment, uh, allow them to do the work you know, they want. Don't interfere from their, you know, team. Once we will do this one, the team will be, you know, too excited to work on the project. And sometimes also HR need to give some small incentives. If the projects are successful, give them some small incentives. So because they have worked hard, uh, you know, aside of their, their existing job. And then in Musoni, let me tell you the experience. In Musoni, we call them Musoni uh, or Innovative Musonites. And this is Musoni Innovative Musonites actually work in different projects, which is actually the successful uh, of the team, of the business team. And that's why our projects don't fail. Uh, in you, if you see the V-shaped module, it's always first the requirement. Uh, what are the requirements comes from the business and the IT will deploy. Once IT will deploy, then again, it will die. Sometimes the projects uh, even deployed and they died. They naturally, you know, they die or sometimes they don't work as uh, it was, you know, uh, uh, amended or as the requirement was. So uh, this is what I will say that agile leadership should be the center and all these points should be worked, you know, in the way that this should work and success of the project. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much, Fahim. Um, that's um, uh, very refreshing. And before we come to questions, uh, let's close the uh, poll now and share the poll with the audience. Actually, I think very much supporting what you were saying. We see the leader is strong communication, what makes up a good agile leader and uh, followed directly by flexibility, adaptability is important. I think uh, we see passion, trust. So I'm actually asking myself if I see this here, um, you have flexibility there, some communication. How different is actually the um, agile leadership from a traditional leadership? Um, or the other way around to ask, I'm, uh, let's imagine, a leader, a, a CEO of a mid-sized bank in an emerging market. And I'm there for a couple of years. I'm doing quite fine. I'm a traditional leader. I'm a micromanagement guy. I can multitask. I look at every detail. I know uh, how it works. And uh, I, I follow up with this stuff. I manage one-to-one. -one. I'm not really the typical agile leader. But my institution is going well. And now some smart consultants come and say, you have to change your leadership style. Um, actually, the transformation aspect for me is the question. So the first is, if I'm not an agile leader, am I a bad leader? And if I want to become agile, how can I make the switch to go to agile? Maybe that's a question we can ask different opinions. So maybe Fahim, you give it a first shot. I would also like to hear Debbie and Victoria and uh, Sergio about this. There was a very big commercial bank. Uh, it was the same, actually, as a live example. Let me give you the live example. In commercial, what the big, one of the biggest commercial banks, the CEO was too forceful. He was not a agile leader. He was a too forceful on so many areas. And then again, the same, you know, as you said, some consultant came and then they, they, they have guided them that you, ne you need to be enabling uh, environment. You need to bring the people to, to focus. Once he actually deployed that, he, he need to understand that there are so many feedback which he was not aware. And then once he got that feedback from the team, he, his eyes was open. He said, uh, uh, I was not aware about these side of the stories also. So as people was a traditional, yes, the project may be successful, but you need to think from the different mind. You need to think from the mind of the people who are at ground, not at the head office or not at the HQ level, where you are thinking that, you know, your projects will work like in this smooth, forcefully or not in an agile way. And then again, you, you want that this should be successful. Maybe it will be successful, but not as more as you want from the enabling environment and to get the feedback from the ground people. Thank you. 
Thank you, Fahim. Thank you. Being authentic is important, I think. Debbie, what, what could you add to this question? Transformation from one to other leadership style and also saying if I'm a non-IG leader, am I a bad leader? <laughs> okay, yes, hard questions. Um, I, I think uh, two points, really. I think ensuring that the leaders do have the digital mindset right at the beginning, yes, and the investment is made in that. Um, there are some very good models to do that. And that they've also got to realize that they're there, and I, and I like this phrase and I go back to it, to actually lead the work, yes. They, they've got to lead that mindset, yes. And, and again, they, they've got to be interested in the impact and let people, you know, down the organization, actually at the coal face, as, as Fahim rightly says, you know, deal with changing the processes and the tasks, yes. So, I, you know, I, I think and it takes time to get leaders to develop that mindset. It's not necessarily a quick thing. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Victoria? Um, uh, yeah, I think I've, I've seen this a couple of times and it, it, it's definitely easier said than done. Um, I recommend doing it, if possible, slowly. <laughs> um, I don't think um, it makes you a bad leader if you're not an agile leader at all. I think actually a lot of the skills required in agile leadership, a lot of the leaders will have. It's just um, uh, certain skills that, that, that I think can be built up over time. But for me, it's, yeah, it's a case of slowly uh, and yeah slowly but surely it's not easy it takes time uh, but with persistence it's possible Sergio you have the difficult task uh, to add something to what your colleagues already said what's uh, less I'm big controversial <laughs> all right so I would say uh, you're not a bad leader if you're not an agile leader right I think um, the problem is you're not a well-rounded leader in uh, the digital age if you're not uh, agile in your leadership style and there is a whole uh, fan, if you want, so uh, of leadership starts. We know that agile leadership uh, has been added just over the last 10 to 15 years, not even, right, to, to that uh, spectrum of leadership styles. And uh, I do agree with Fahim that uh, in order to be a good leader, especially for project implementation, agile leadership is, is very important and, and critical nowadays. Okay. I think what we can say is basically that um, for sure digital transformation uh, also requires transformation of how you lead an organization and that agile leadership is definitely um, uh, a proven way of doing uh, things better and differently. Um, I picked up and we copied this I think already in the chat a uh, LinkedIn article from Ellen Dele five years ago, a very good one way uh, you can see on just one and a half pages. Uh, how he makes a difference between the traditional and the agile. And the quote is, traditional managers make sure people do things right. Agile managers, managers make sure they do the right things. Well, I think uh, also I heard this from, um, uh, from Peter Drucker. I think uh, uh, it was uh, differently said, but very nice quote, of course. And uh, Debbie, thanks for copying also um, the link to Ernst uh, Young, uh, who built a digital... Um, uh, agile leadership framework, I think. So um, there's some stuff uh, our dear audience can uh, read into if they are interested in this. With this, thank you very much, Fahim. And we'll move on to Victoria's presentation of a new payroll system at a bank and um, about the role of agile leadership in that. Victoria, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Michael. Um, I'm going from a personal experience here, so um, I'll give a bit of background. So um, this bank in the UK had seen rapid growth. We'd gone from 500 to 1500 employees in less than five years. And that, uh, that saw 100 branches to 200 branches within that time. So very quick growth. Um, and as you can imagine, um, the back end systems were trying to play catch up uh, after this time. So the head of HR operations was running this project. Um, and she brought myself as a HR business partner on and um, a payroll, one of my payroll colleagues. <clears throat> um, and it was a case of um, integrating a new external system with our IT systems. Um, and so the, if we could go to the next slide, um, the, the kind of the main, the key things uh, to motivate staff to actively support this, um, we, we found was um, like gaining buy-in. And I don't mean just in the traditional sense of at the start, um, although we did do this, uh, it's getting senior management on board, you know, presenting the commercial benefits. This was going to save 
branches time that's a great thing yes we did do that but also uh, what i saw was gaining buy-in from the teams on the ground if that makes sense so the teams actually implementing this so the hr teams the it teams um so that was constant communication why are we doing this um it was a lot of work for them uh so i think it's it's ensuring that at, at all times you're, you're keeping them updated on on why why we're we're asking for more feedback why why we need them to change the system again um and then something i i personally saw um, myself was um i guess effective teamwork so uh, i was given a lot of autonomy i ran huge parts of the project which i hadn't really had uh before before this so it was um yeah it was an exciting uh, project and that we i guess also allowed and trusted the the it teams and the hr teams and and actually that created um a lot of innovation and creativity they say you know that's what happens and it was really amazing to see it actually happen you know we had the hr teams coming to us and saying we know this isn't going to work because uh, of xyz and that doesn't mean all the time we took on uh, any changes they suggested but it was great because they caught things uh, often before later down the line <laughs> they went wrong so it was that was really uh, interesting to see and then finally for me um my the, the the manager leading it was was so passionate about this project um it was it was uh, for us it was so beneficial um like the kind of report we could have got out of this um so i kind of took on that passion then i was selling it you know to the hr teams and this is going to make our lives so much better so it was definitely for me um that kind of commitment that passion for a project is uh, really important and actually it was wonderful to see on the poll just there that um you know good communi strong communication absolutely um constant collaboration with with your team and and um commitment all three of those things for me intertwined and, and i saw them firsthand and it was yeah definitely great thank you michael victoria thank you very much um also really an exciting case study and um yeah you you described the components of the agile leadership for for this uk-based bank very clearly i mean you said effective communication between different teams empowerment of staff a uh, high degree of trust you said across mm -hmm. the hierarchy and i just wonder was this the result of a change of the leadership style in the corporate culture or it had been in the bank already before so it had been it had been working in this manner for a while um but definitely for us it was it was a change uh, hence the pushback from hr teams that we that we did get <laughs> it was a change yeah and yeah. i mean i guess the change is only possible if you do it across the vertical the hierarchy basically so starting from the top and going down right i mean so can you maybe describe how the change happened then from the old style to the new style and was it basically just adding new things or was it also you know like stopping doing things that are not good anymore i mean that's a different story if you stop doing things or you just add new things how was it change managed and initiated yes. Uh, for us, it was definitely a top-down approach. We uh, were very lucky as a HR team. We'd worked very hard to get um, uh, to be very close to senior management, and they lent. Luckily, they lent on us a lot, and that's not an easy thing. Um, but I would recommend HR. I think Debbie mentioned, you know, being being close, uh, being such a big part, and I think people often forget that, um, and and they're left to the side. And and it and that had happened. Um, hence IT working in that way and we weren't. So um, definitely um, it was a case of, of, of getting the buy-in from, from senior management and, it, and that trickling down um, and that did happen. Um, and sorry, the second part of your question was, was it the change? Yeah, how you, how you actually, um, uh, what were maybe your lessons learned from or takeaways from managing the change from um, if you stop doing things basically also yeah i mean how big was the change and how you managed it um i think the team saw it, the other the teams on the other side of it uh, saw it as more work uh, for me um it what it can appear like that but it, the end result is that there is uh that you work more effectively um so 
uh, yeah, the change, the change for them was, uh, I think, painful, but uh, for, for, for me, it was exciting, definitely. Okay, great. And um, anything to say, how the cooperation between the HR function and the, um, the senior management went um, more concrete? Was your HR director, was, the, was he or she a part of the executive team or, uh, or was it below the executive team? Um, they were a part of the ex executive team. So that's where I think um, we, were, we were really lucky in, in having them on board. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. Yeah. And I mean, what, the question to the other speakers also here, um, uh, in your view, uh, the organizational setup of, uh, uh, of a given organization, uh, how critical is that uh, for allowing that um, involvement and the empowerment of the HR function to happen? I mean, uh, how, how important is the organizational setup? What can we learn from that? Maybe Debbie, you have something to say about that or Sergio? I th Hello, Michael. Yes. I think you have to be clear what kind of partner HR is right from the beginning. Yes. Mm. And different organizations, it will be different types of, you know, engagement, etc. And I do think you have to recognize the impact on HR. Yes. And be realistic of what the real change is. I think that's often estimated. Yes. Mm. And, uh, you know, in some cases, HR may have put a lot of effort into developing a new process or a system only to find that it's sort of being sabotaged really from their point of view. So sometimes you have to put in some temporary hooks to make things work. Yeah. So that's where the agility comes in. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Debbie. Yes. Um, any other comments from Fahim or Sergio? If not, that's fine. I would just one thing. Uh, I would just like to say one thing, uh, Michael. The mm -hmm. HR work is now different. It's not like hiring the talent and deploying the talent. It is also to check the performance of the talent which they have deployed and mm -hmm. continuously, you know, uh, bringing them in the agile model. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And also, um, uh, yeah, Sergio, you have anything to add? Mm -hmm. Please. Yeah, very briefly, uh, Michael, I think it's very important, uh, even before thinking about organizational structure and how to redo it, uh, to make sure that HR can sit uh, at the table with business leaders. Uh, think first about, uh, yeah, who do you have uh, in the HR function? Who are the persons leading that function? And are they doing their homework, right, to deserve to be at the round table with the business leaders? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And also, um, I'm picking up a comment we got um, in the chat. I think everyone can see probably in Africa, most CEOs are distracted with personal gains and rather than develop a world-class organization to compete. Uh, my research recently showed this, Fahim nailed it. Uh, agile leadership is more committed to the core values of the organization. Um, yeah, I, I think that's for me a very good comment where we see well, it's the benefit for the whole organization, for all the organization, of course, also for the clients that is um, ahead of us. We look at this and if we are a leader, the leader is not the one who tells the team how to get there, but basically now say, we want to be there, but how you get there, please that make yourself basically, uh, you decide how we, how we do the journey. Probably we can all ag agree on that. And with that, uh, we come to the end of block two. We have to move on. Um, I, before we move to the third block now, I would like to invite uh, our peer audience uh, to actively uh, make use of asking questions. Um, there are still not so many questions. Um, so you have, we have time to answer a few questions at the end. So please um, feel free to ask them. And with that, I'm moving on to block three, workplace training in the digital age, where we start again with a poll. So may I ask the poll to be coming up, please? Uh, where we ask in your organization, what is currently the share of staff training that is happening to digital learning? So very straightforward answer. And uh, we will hear a presentation from Sergio. I think you can start with the presentation. We'll look later at the poll. Um, and um, share your experience as the head of uh, learning and development at a global network at Finca, uh, how you managed this to set up. I think uh, you were just very lucky in timing, right? Because when you started, no one could think about COVID-19. 
and now you were ready when the uh, when the when the waves stop. So I think absolutely. That's, Absolutely. That's a good example. So, Sergio, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michael. So, I think we all can agree that over the past uh, decade, microfinance institutions and banks uh, have put financial services uh, at the fingertips of clients increasingly. And uh, I've seen many great things uh, being accomplished over the last 10 years, uh, working with Thinker Impact Finance to simply improve the way that, that we serve our clients, right? Um, but the question is uh, for today's uh, webinar, at least for my part uh, in this webinar today, uh, what about the employees, right, in our financial institutions who are part of this uh, digital revolution? How can we support employees in terms of uh, rapid change by providing learning opportunities in the digital domain? Um, I was talking to a senior manager of a larger company recently, and uh, he described to me the situation in his business. This is uh, what he said about the current state um, of job training at, at his company. He said, at this point, we're asking our employees to drive uh, a massive truck to sell and deliver our services to clients. And then he added, uh, but all we are, we are applying as a company to develop their skills is simply a bike. Yeah, I mm -hmm. found that uh, very interesting to hear the comment from him. And I think he was really regretting um, that uh, his company had not been doing enough over the past uh, seven to 10 years, he, he mentioned to me, to make uh, staff training and development part of the company's larger digital transformation. So um, to my own experience and to share a bit uh, about uh, my own experience uh, with you today, a few years ago, I was working uh, as a manager of learning systems and technology with Finca. And um, let me share with you a little bit uh, what the situation was like uh, with uh, job training uh, at Finca back then. And I think we can go to the first slide here, Michael. Thank you. So until the, or actually the second slide, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So until the end of 2016, around 98% of employee training at Finca was uh, in-person training. This is a global network of 20 um, microfinance banks and institutions with over 10,000 employees on average, somewhere around 500 employees per country. And the share of digital learning was below 2%. Fortunately, the learning and development team at Finca's Global HQ office, and I was part of uh, that uh, two-man uh, show, um, managed to get the buy-in um, of uh, senior management by making the business case for digital learning. Um, we had to implement first a learning management system. We didn't have one at that point at Think Impact Finance. And uh, this is uh, the first thing we needed to implement to uh, get uh, the digital transformation of our job training started. Uh, we managed to get to this important milestone by the end of 2016. It took around five to six months uh, to get this accomplished uh, around, yeah, once more, a global network of 20 countries plus the US as a, uh, yeah, HQ country, so to say, for the global network. During the following um, two years in 2017 and 18, what we did uh, was to simply focus on converting existing in-person training, what you would normally refer to as classroom training into e-learning courses. One of the tangible results was the increase of digital learning from under 2% at the end of 2016 to 27% by the end of 2019. So what are the main lessons that I learned, that we learned at Finca, the team in the learning and development um, function within human resources during this transformation of learning and development at Finca? Well, number one, um, and it might surprise some of you, employees, value digital learning opportunities as much as they value in-person training. Oftentimes you will hear employees do you want, uh, first of all, in-person training that is so much more exciting and dynamic than um, face to, um, virtual training or e-learning courses, etc. That was not the experience at Think Impact Finance. What we saw is that uh, the majority of employees really embraced and valued uh, digital learning opportunities. Number two, digital learning contributes to the, I would call it digital savvy of, of employees. If applied well, digital learning can be a very powerful way to increase the ownership employees decide to take in the digital transformation of the core business, right? 
um, it just adds to, to that digital savvy and competence that you want them to develop to at the end also right, implement uh, digital channels and uh, get your clients at the front line to use your digital channels. Number three, digital learning reduces the cost of training delivery. That is true. And by training delivery is, what I mean is um, literally the delivery at the end of the whole uh, process of training uh, in the workplace in general. But uh, make no mistake, yeah, you need to be ready to make an initial and ongoing investment to digitize staff training. The money that you might be saving um, in delivering training face-to-face if you decide to go for digital learning, you will be spending that money, first of all, to uh, produce digital learning solutions and content. Number four, the implementation of a learning management system does not need to be costly. This was a very important uh, lesson to learn for us at Finca. We thought at the beginning of all this, we needed to go with a commercial learning management system. We decided to go for a um, so-called open source learning management system, a system that is basically for free available on the internet for the IT department to install on a cloud or on a local server. Um, the setup cost was minimal for Finca. I'm talking about a few thousand dollars. And uh, the most surprising thing uh, was that the recurring annual cost per employee was less than $3, which is pretty amazing compared to our commercial learning management systems where you would be looking more at 15 to $25 uh, as of today per employee annually. And number five, um, last but not least, digital learning increases the speed at which you're able to deploy training to your staff. This paid off um, in the case of Inca Impact Finance when uh, COVID-19 disrupted uh, the daily routine of all employees earlier this year. And uh, Finca needed to respond very quickly to support staff in coping with the new reality. If we wouldn't have the experience of 2017, 18, 19, deploying constantly month after month, um, new e-learning courses and digital learning solutions to all of our staff at all levels of the organization, we wouldn't have been able to respond as quickly as we did uh, in mm -hmm. March and April of this year to respond to COVID-19. That would be it, Michael. Thank you very much, Sergio. Great example for um, being on time with the implementation of an innovation of um, e-learning. Um, so I start with the question from the audience. We got a few. Which LMS do you use, uh, Sergio? Uh, we decided to go for the Moodle system. You might find three to four um, open source LMS uh, platforms out there in the universe of learning management uh, systems and platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, Moodle is probably the most uh, important one. And uh, by the way, also the largest, uh, mostly uh, the most used uh, LMS system in the world, um, Moodle. So M-O-O-D-L-E, uh, an Australian open source system um, to install a learning management system within days uh, in your company. Okay, thanks. So and Moodle was used as a system. Mm -hmm. thank Moodle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And we have another question. How did you promote digital learning in your company in the beginning? So how did you pass away when uh, moving away from the classroom type of learning? Good question. It was pretty much a top-down um, approach. Um, we made it pretty much uh, mandatory. I think in most of our organizations, when job training happens, no matter what the modality is, be it e-learning, um, be it a virtual class um, workshop, be it a face-to-face uh, -face course, uh, employees are being asked, right, to uh, participate and attend um, these uh, trainings. And uh, it wasn't different with uh, e-learning. Uh, we would put out a course, roll it out, push it out to our staff and uh, training managers, HR managers in, in all of our countries would communicate uh, accordingly to staff uh, that this needed to be completed within a certain deadline. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you, Sergio. And we have another question. Did you develop digital learning for your clients? For the end clients? No, mm -hmm. no we did not. We were looking at uh, possibilities to um, develop content for financial uh, literacy training to clients that uh, they would then access through their smartphones, mobile devices, um, very small bites 
of um, yeah, training um, to customers to increase their financial literacy and understanding about financial services. But we didn't go, we didn't get there, unfortunately, um, this year due to COVID-19. Okay, great. Um, we don't have any more questions from the audience. Maybe one from my side. We don't have much time left. Um, you mentioned a lot about e-learning now. So what other digital learning instruments we are, are being used uh, or were used basically? You have webinars as well. And how did you combine them with each other? Yeah, so um, digital learning, right? It's a big word. Uh, it does include the uh, modality that most of us think of when we say digital learning, which is an e-learning course, right? Uh, Self-paced, self-directed. It might take somewhere between 30 to 45 minutes most of the time to finalize an e-learning course on a learning management system. However, uh, let's um, make sure we understand that digital learning does uh, include at least a handful of uh, yeah, uh, modalities to deliver training uh, virtually, digitally, if you want. So a very important one is um, the virtual instructor-led uh, training, going on a platform like Zoom or go to training or Adobe Connect, which is basically a platform for virtual classrooms and um, delivering a webinar like the one we're doing today here together, or a, a presentation, a workshop, and engaging your audience as much as possible. Very important, something we were not doing uh, a lot at Finca, but I think uh, with uh, improving connectivity of internet, et cetera, in the countries we are all in, um, in this audience here, uh, hopefully that that modality will um, become much more important in the coming years. Okay, um, we have to wrap it up. We have one or two more questions coming in. We'll answer them by email then. But um, as we want to arrive, uh, and we have to wrap up the poll three also, so uh, which I didn't do so uh, yet. So can we share the results, please? Please, we see uh, five to fifteen percent is the leading. Uh, so that's uh, uh, fair below what is um, uh, considered 45%, I think is the benchmark, right? Something like that, Sergio, you said uh, it should be. So it yeah, has potential exactly. to grow, yeah? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I mean, the good news is that uh, most of uh, the institutions, banks represented uh, by the audience of this webinar here today, right? They are doing uh, digital learning. So congratulations to all of you who have um, started this. Uh, it's a process, it doesn't happen overnight, uh, but uh, as long as that figure keeps increasing year after year, um, 40, 45% is a good benchmark to look at, but look at your own uh, countries, uh, look at other banks, try to find out um, what they're doing with digital learning and what's the share of digital learning mm. as of today in, in, in these uh, banks, uh, starting with your own, and then create your own benchmark that relates also to your local market and um, country. Thank you very much. And um, we'll get a few more questions. So uh, again, we'll answer them, but we have to wrap it up to stay on time. Uh, I just, I'm left with um, indicating that BFC uh, also has an e-learning system. It's called EduBanks. The link of the landing page will be copied now in the chat. And we have been uh, offering this since 2016, had over 12,000 users, have 50 courses. So if you are interested to learn more, go to the landing page or write us. And uh, mm -hmm. with this, we come to conclude our uh, journey today. So um, I think digital transformation as a summary requests from us uh, to change the way how we uh, manage our human resources and how we manage ourselves. Uh, that's for sure a big change for us. But uh, what the good news is, is that the importance of people uh, in business stays at the top Without the people, you can't go anywhere. And I think today we have very interesting insights of how we can manage that change together in a good and constructive way. And with this, uh, I'd like to give a very big thank you to my uh, co-speakers, to my crew, uh, to Debbie, Sergio, Fahim, and Victoria. Thank you so much for spending your personal time to be on this session with us today on this flight. Uh, so we arrive on time again back in Zurich at 11 after one hour. We hope our audience had a great time and we look forward to see you again in two weeks. There's an announcement for the next session. If I can call up the slide here. 
making digitization happen through smart partnerships. So don't miss the 10th of September. And I finally announce a new FinTech bulletin, a special one on this edition today, which will be shared with all of you who have registered for this webinar by email after that. With this and one minute delay only, I say bye-bye to you. Thanks to my co-speakers and have a great rest of the week and stay healthy. It's not rocket science. It all can be done and you are great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everyone.